Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. My name is Kate Bruns, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, I am so pleased to welcome you to this event with Scott Small discussing his brand new book, Forgetting the Benefits of Not Remembering, in conversation with Sue Halpern. Tonight's event is a part of our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which brings the authors of recently published science-related literature to our Cambridge community and now very far beyond it. Be on the lookout for more Science Book Talks coming up in August, which should be posted to our website shortly. To learn more about the series, you can visit the webpage harvard.com science or sign up for the bookstore's email newsletter at harvard.com. We also have a YouTube page where you can view previous talks that you might have missed, and I'm going to be posting links in the Zoom chat in just a few minutes. Tonight's event will conclude with some time for your questions. If you would like to ask our speaker something, please go to the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen where you can submit a question. We're going to get through as many as time allows for this evening. Uh, this event is also going to have closed captioning available. So depending on the version of Zoom that you're using, you might need to enable captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption button on your screen. I would also like to say a tremendous thank you, as I always do, for your patronage during these virtual times. Your support makes this author series possible and ensures the future of a landmark indie bookstore. So thank you to our partners at Harvard and thank you to all of you for tuning in and showing up for our authors, for indie book selling and especially for science. Finally, as you might have experienced in virtual gatherings, I'm sure you have, technical issues can arise and if they do, we'll do our best to resolve them quickly. Thanks for your patience and your understanding. So now I am delighted to introduce tonight's speakers. Dr. Scott Small is the director of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center at Columbia University, where he is the Boris and Rose Katz Professor of Neurology. He's published more than 140 studies on memory function and malfunction, earning him the Beeson Scholar Award in Aging Research from the American Federation on Aging, the McKnight Neuroscience of Brain Disorders Award, and more. Most recently, his research into Alzheimer's disease led him to co-found a new biotech company, Retromer Therapeutics. Joining him in conversation tonight is best-selling writer and journalist, Sue Halpern, the author most recently of the novel, Summer Hours at the Robbers Library. Currently a scholar in residence at Middlebury College, Sue's writing has appeared in The New Yorker, New York Review of Books, Rolling Stone, and more. This evening, the two will be discussing Dr. Small's first book, Forgetting, hailed by author Walter Isaacson as both fascinating and useful. Of the book, Sue herself writes, Forgetting is the work of an accomplished neuroscientist who follows in the tradition of Oliver Sacks, illuminating the mysteries of the brain with personal stories and lively, accessible writing. We are so pleased to host them for tonight's sure to be fascinating event. So without further ado, Sue and Scott, the digital podium is all yours. Great. Hi, Scott. Hello. <laughs> hey, Sue. Nice seeing you. <laughs> you too. So Scott and I were just talking a little bit and we were talking about how we actually know each other. And I just wanted to start a little bit with that. We were trying to remember who, who, who had the better story. Um, and I go with me. Um, we met many years ago when I was writing a book um, that tried to answer the question, what is normal memory loss? And the reason why I was writing that book was because people are asking me this question, um, you know, why can't I find my keys? Where are my glasses? And they kept on thinking they had Alzheimer's disease. And I reached out to Scott, um, whose uh, work was really in this field of normal memory loss. And um, from there, we spent a lot of time together. I wrote the book, I wrote a piece for The New Yorker. And um, unlike a lot of other times when one is a journalist, uh, we became pretty good friends. So, so Scott, what do you think? No, that's, that's, that's accurate. And I, it's actually interesting that you start with, um, the first association early in my early career, and that is between normal aging related memory loss and Alzheimer's. And in many ways, I never even thought about this. This book 
is now completely a third category. And that's just normal forgetting that occurs in all of us, not part of the aging process, but normal unto itself. Right, and that's something I think that's really confusing because what do you mean by normal forgetting? Like, how is that, how is that normal? What does normal even mean? Well, that's a, of course a very uh, uh, complicated question, I think, to, to, to answer that conclusively, but I think in the spirit of the book in general, I think most people would say normal is something that we're born with, we all have, occurs naturally. And that is true for forgetting, right? Pathological forgetting, and that's maybe I'll say this at the get-go if you don't mind, Sue, because it's very important for me that no one thinks that I've written a book that sort of um, poeticizes pathology. Uh, there is pathological forgetting, and that by definition means it's a worsening from your own baseline. Now, whether that's caused by Alzheimer's or the normal wear and tear of aging, that's pathological. And I would never, uh, being exposed to all my patients, somehow say there's a silver lining to that. This is in contrast to that, something we all are born with occurs naturally, and yet we all complain about it. <laughs> One of the things you did was you, you say in the book that, that forgetting is a cognitive gift. Um, what does that mean? How is it a gift? Well, it's, it's, it's a gift uh, only because most people, to kind of turn it on its head, thought it was a curse. Most people I speak to, and that's, why, as you know, I begin the book, they hear I'm a memory doctor, and no matter what they age they are at any stage of their life, they will start complaining about their forgetting as if it's uh, not exactly a curse, <clears throat> but a problem, a failure of sorts. And so what emerged from writing this book, I wouldn't necessarily describe anything as a gift, it's certainly not um, a, a, a mother nature's gift, but in writing the book and in reading for it, it occurred to me that it's only by balancing memory with normal forgetting that forgetting is a gift because it allows us to be better, smarter, happier people. Okay. Um, one of the things I, I want people to know about this book, aside from the fact that it's beautifully written, is that you are a, really have become a master of the metaphor. Um, and that's really important when you're writing about science. Because, um, you know, as we know, science can be complicated, it can be difficult to understand. Um, some of my favorite metaphors in this book, aside from the fact that you call yourself a brain mechanic, um, uh, there's one where you, you're talking about the different regions of the brain and you call the prefrontal cortex the school librarian and you call the hippocampus a school teacher. And I'm just wondering, like, one of the things that's also really remarkable and wonderful about this book is just how literary it is. Like, and I know this about you, you are a reader, you care deeply about literature. And that, that's kind of in a funny way, also how we met because you had been reading some of the stuff that I had written. And I'm just wondering, like, as a scientist, where does literature fit into the clinical work you do, the translational work you do? Ah, that's a really, really interesting question. I'll get to the more important question in a second. On metaphors, I actually begin the book. The first chapter of the, the first paragraph of the chapter, in a way, is spoofing the use of metaphors, particularly for memory. There are a lot of them, and my first patient uses the only one that I detest, and that's the sort of um, bear trap, <laughs> a steel trap analogy. Uh, there are many metaphors. The real challenge for me was not tripping on too many, but I used them sparingly when I thought deeply about what really is most helpful uh, in trying to read the stories of the book, because this is a book about stories to try to impart uh, the science. Now, on the uh, influence between literature and science, I, I, I start the book with a quote from Borges, and uh, I, I have a chapter on the book that talks about how Borges actually, in his short story called Funus the Memorius, this is about an Argentinian cowboy, for those who don't know, who uh, is thrown from his horse, wakes up with an inflamed brain, and can't forget anything the true photographic memory we sometimes fantasize about having. And Borges in the 1940s and 50s intuited 
in a literary sense that this was a curse, not the gift we think it is. And it was very interesting to me that he was writing at the same time that uh, Leo Kanner, the father of American psychiatry, the person who introduced the term autism, started wondering about autism and too much memory. So there's an interesting link there, but clearly in that particular case, Borges um, completely foreshadowed our understanding or even appreciation of the, um, the detriments of having a mind that can forget. Um, let's talk about autism for, for a minute. This was one of the chapters that I found most fascinating. I, it was something that um, I really read and thought, I have never thought of this this way. And um, one of the things that you're talking about is, is that with autism, often there's a fixation on, here's a metaphor, uh, the, <laughs> the, the trees instead of the forest. And I'm wondering if you could talk more about that and about the, how, how that works in autism and why forgetting um, becomes so important and how by looking at people who are autistic and what they focus on, we learn more about this concept of normal forgetting and its benefits. Yeah, that, it's, it, was, it was really interesting. And in every chapter, I sort of have a guide that helps me. In this case, it was Dan Geshwin, who's one of the leading autism researchers and doctors in the country from UCLA. Um, and in many ways, it was, I think when I talk to people about the book, it's the punchline that's harder to really get intuitively. I think most people intuitively understand you need to forget to forgive. They understand that it's not good to to loop obsessively over emotional memories, right? But why would forgetting something that effectively takes away from our brains actually make us smarter and, 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 and intellectually uh, more astute? I will start, you'll forgive me, Sue, by saying if we're talking about autism, I need to say very carefully that uh, it's not all about, it's not all autism and there is a, a, le a legitimate debate in the field about whether it's a disease, many diseases or no disease at all, just biodiversity. And I'm completely respectful of that position. But it was fascinating to me to read Leo Kanner's original manuscripts, his, the two where he introduces the term autism. And in the second one, which is the most cited one, he basically says autism is a disorder where uh, the kids, because there were mainly children who were presented to him at Johns Hopkins, who, um, can't associate the parts from the whole, they obsess on the parts. And that's such an interesting observation. Again, in this case, uh, uh, foreshadowing sort of psychology, the psychology of something that's so fundamental to our cognitive abilities, and that's the ability to generalize. So the example I use in the book, which comes out of Borges, if you, and I know both you and I um, are dog lovers, Borges, um, describes that, that if we didn't have the ability to generalize, we would not be able to recognize our dog in the morning and the evening, because after all, the uh, visual areas of our brain are seeing very different information. We would say different dog. And that's just a very almost simplistic, maybe absurd example of the ability to generalize. There's something in our brains that knows how to extract a gist and to generalize. And that gist extraction, as computer science has taught us, requires forgetting, requires that the areas in our brain that are processing information doesn't get too sticky with memory, allows the information to flow and to extract a forest and not a tree. So I, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I did too. And I just, I, I, I was thinking about, you know, people I know, um, whether or not they have autism, but just this idea of kind of um, of intellectual flexibility yeah. that it's it, it's dependent on forgetting. It's dependent on our brains being able to 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 make connections and associations. And I th I thought that was really interesting. I also thought I was thinking um, about how if you can't do that then when you look at something um, that has, is out of order, you know, if, if you're looking at something and, it's, and you have a kind of rigid understanding of what something should be um, and it's changed, uh, it's disturbing. It's extremely disturbing. And that's exactly what I quote a lot from, from Kanner because again, he basically says 
that these kids are suffering from any change from their environment, any change. And in the book, I use an example to think for ourselves what, what it would be like. And I use an example of going to New Year's Eve in, in, in Times Square, cacophony noise, lots of fun. I was older, we were both old, uh, younger then. Uh, but even then, um, after a while, it became discomforting with everything being so novel and new. And one could imagine that if everything is novel and new, if your brain can't say, no, that's old, I know that, I recognize that, and organizes the clutter, squelches the, 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 the cacophony, then it would really be anxiety provoking. So I, I, I think that's, that's really interesting. I did too. And I also thought that the other, other part of that is sort of almost like a flip side of that is, is your discussion about savantism. Um, and I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about that because there's a way in which um, you know, we look at savantism and we think, oh my goodness, that's amazing. And it is amazing. But, but from what I get from reading you is that the gift of savantism is the flip side of that is this, uh, a kind of inability to generalize that it, and that it, you know, so yeah. I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about. Yeah. That. Yeah. I I think, I think that's true. Again, I might say this a few times, you know me, Sue. So I, I don't want to um, simplify too much on this sort yeah. of seesaw. But, but that actually is generally true. In other words, this idea of having um, a pocket of incredible ability to store lists of information, that is what, in the, so savantism just means that you have a pocket of cognitive ability that's much better than everything else. In this case, it's not for the kind of flexible creative memories we talk about. It's really for specific um, list learning and music memorizing. And that ability might very well reflect the sticky cortices that are able to store all this information. And it might, although I'm not sure about this, it might come at the cost well, it probably does. I guess I would have to infer that, but I, again, want to be careful. It, it, it comes at the cost of being able to, um, to, to generalize and to not get stuck on the details. But here you are, you, you know, you are one of the great, you know, neuroscientists, translational scientists, you know, a lot, you have got a lot in your big brain. Um, uh, you don't have to agree with me, <laughs> but, um, but how, how does a person like you, someone who's you know super, super smart, but also has to keep a lot of stuff in their head, um, be able to do that? I mean, there's, there's a kind of weird level of savantism um, in people who have this you know, ability as you do to know so much um, and Actually, not forget what you, you know, not forget. I, 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 I gather I'm allowed to, disagree uh, in, 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 in this discussion. I'll disagree with that in a way uh, that, and it actually links to this other chapter on creativity, um, that people who, who know a lot often, they don't know the details, they remember just. So, you know, the old story about chess players, the, the, the seven plus or minus two. You don't actually, you, you remember chunks, but if you were to remember actually every detail, you wouldn't be able to store a lot of information across multiple domains. You might be in one domain, you know, you'd be able to be like a, like a robot sort of listing things, but the ability to synthesize across multiple domains, which is one definition of creativity, requires extracting gists. And that ability requires some forgetting, which I learned from writing this book. And I will tell you, and if there's any uh, of my ex-medical uh, trainees on the call, they will tell you, I was never the one who can just sort of list through a differential diagnosis. I, I don't think my memory is necessarily excellent. It was good enough, but I, on that kind of rote memory, in terms of synthetic thinking, yeah. which is a form of smartness, I think actually forgetting might be helpful there. That's interesting. Um, that's good to know <laughs> <laughs> for all of us. Um, you know, part of this book is pretty personal. Um, I mean, there are a lot of stories um, and, and they have to do with your work um, or people you know um, or your patients. Um, but there is this one chapter which is incredibly moving and also um, 
a little upsetting, not in like real terms, but just, just to read it, to know, and maybe this is just because I know you, um, but it's your chapter on PTSD and um, it's very personal. And I'm wondering if you can just talk a little bit about how you came to write that chapter, because I think that story is really interesting, um, both in terms of the experience that you had that you're talking about, but also the experience of coming to write that chapter. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, in the process. And you're absolutely right. That was, so at some level, that's the easiest chapter to understand. So it's a chapter about PTSD. I think, you know, if we talked about generalization, abstract, um, just that's not completely intuitive. I think everyone knows that PTSD is a disorder of too many emotional memories that we can't quite shake it. So that's easy to explain. But then on the process, uh, I was talking to, to my editor and other people and the idea was for every chapter to either have a doctor or a patient or, or a storyline. Uh, and the person I was talking to at Columbia, Yuval Nurial, who's head of the PTSD program at Columbia, he knew that I grew up in Israel. He knew that I served uh, in the military in Israel, and he knew that my unit had this 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 event that led to trauma, emotional trauma. And so he said, "Well, why don't you write about your your own personal experience?" I said, "Yeah, that's funny." <laughs> and, and 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 ultimately, I did. Uh, it was very very tough. It was tough, first of all, because a lot of things that I end up talking about we as sort of comrades in arms never really talk about it, it, it only hidden uh, behind the macabre, macabre humor of gallows humor. We never really go into it. It was hard because so I didn't want to violate confidences. It was hard emotionally. And when I ended up writing it, uh, you know, my sleeping definitely changed. My dreams were influenced. But it ended up to be really, really interesting because it, it actually posed, you know, back to the interesting question, it allowed me to talk with Yuval about, well, here are people who are exposed to the same trauma. Some people develop PTSD and some not. Well, what's up with that? Why is it? And it, and it, 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 it caused me the other part that's difficult about that chapter, Sue. So you know that I'm a sort of a reductionist, a hardcore, I think about cells and molecules. And I end, end up that chapter talking about love. <laughs> I talked way too much about love in a book for someone like me, but it led me there. He basically was telling me that the strongest risk factor for why a certain person um, will develop PTSD versus someone else who's exposed to the same event is the person who, who, who is socially isolated after the event, who is not, um, uh, not uh, exposed to the kind of social fabric of love and laughter are those people who will develop PTSD, or at least as a risk factor, obviously a lot of complicated things. So as someone who's thinking of developing drugs for Alzheimer's and stuff like that, it really, really was fascinating to say that basically the best therapy, if we can use that word, for something like PTSD to accelerate our emotional forgetting is something behavioral and social. Uh, and I end the chapter, I think, saying something, live a life glittered, uh, with 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 love and friends, which uh, which you know still makes me cringe a little bit, but I, I found that <laughs> interesting. Well, so one of the things that happens with <clears throat> with PTSD is, uh, in terms of treatment, is exposure therapy, yes. and um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and how that fits in with with forgetting because the whole point of exposure therapy is to say the same thing over and over and over again to relive this memory again and again and again so why does why is that useful why is that therapeutically beneficial and how does that fit into the paradigm of forgetting when the whole point of it is to repeat the experience yes it fits perfectly um and, it be, and basically, if one would reduce a memory to an association, so a face and a name, right? That's the one I use over and over again in the book. But in this case, it's an event and an emotion. That's what's being associated. That's what's being stapled in the, in the setting of PTSD. So what, um, what exposure therapy does is it, it loosens that association by showing, exposing to a phobia, let's say, over and over again, but now uh, not associated with the painful association. So it actually does exactly tap into the, uh, 
the science of forgetting uh, and how forgetting actually happens. So if memory in a very simplistic way happens when two uh, pieces of information represented by two neurons uh, strengthen their connections, forgetting essentially happens when those connections are loosened. And so if I show you an event over and over again, but now without the associated painful uh, memory, you actually are engaging your forgetting mechanisms to dissociate that memory, that emotional memory. And, and one of the things you also write about, um, uh, sort of briefly mention, is the use of drugs like ecstasy um, for the treatment of PTSD and probably for other things as well. And I'm wondering how that interrupts the memory formation, the memory, you know, it, 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 how does it um, enhance forgetting? What does it do? Well, it, it's really interesting, and you use the right term, wondering about formation. So, uh, you know, many, I think, people know that just like a computer, we divide memory into the formation of memory, the, the shifting it from a short term to a long term, the shifting, the retrieval, and then the storage of memory. And for the longest time, emotional memories were thought to be distributed. Of course they are. But what, one of the really interesting, really good science that has come out in the last five years is that me emotional memories truly are stored uh, fundamentally in one part of the brain called the amygdala. And one of the things that ecstasy does do is sort of turn down the amygdala. So basically, this is very simplistic, but not far from the truth that when you think of a childhood bully or of an emotional memory, your amygdala is activated and is firing. Mm -hmm. And people who have PTSD have a brain on fire with too much memory activation in their memory storage areas. And one thing, not the only thing, but one thing that oxytocin does is dial down that activity, which is effectively another way of um, relaxing those fearful memories from uh from looping into our minds but why is that why is that permanent like why 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 is it only why does it only affect you while you're in that state of of being receptive to the to the drug right. and why when the drug passes uh, do, doesn't its effect pass right that's it well well i think what you're asking is right that basically it's temporary as long as you're on the drug the, the, the fear of forgetting has been diminished, but when the drug, and that's because it's still stored in the amygdala. And if you really want to get rid of the storage, you might need more, you know, psychotherapy and more complicated things. But it does, it does illustrate how fear, fear memories and forgetting of them, by which I mean just, just, just turning them down temporarily, can improve our personality. So you mentioned ecstasy. Of course, as a doctor, I can't uh, advocate it. I think Michael <laughs> Pollan was on this. On, 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 on this program, but um, ecstasy was called ecstasy because when people take it, they feel ecstatic with, with pro-social feelings, even love, back to love. And ecstasy does a lot, but one of the areas of the brain that it does the most in is really to turn down activity um, in your amygdala. So if you think of your hard drive just cranking out, just too hot and burning and feeding information onto your screen, it turns it down, which is a great personal way to experience the benefits of not completely eradicating fear memories, but at least squelching them momentarily. So, you know, you talk a lot about regions of the brain and what's going on in the brain and dendrites and, neuro, you know, axons and neurons and so on and so forth. But I'm wondering, and, and in this, I'm wondering this in part because one of the things that you and I did uh, way back when was talk a lot about genes. Um, and I'm wondering where, and, and I'm thinking about this in particular in relation to PTSD, where genes come in. Um, you remember a couple of years ago, there was, there was a lot of talk about the resilience gene, yeah. right? Um, and I'm just wondering, like, where do genes fit into to forgetting and to, to the paradigms that you're setting up? Well, genes, uh, you know, the easy answer is that genes fit into everything. Uh, I think a lot of that, a, a lot of that research I think we were talking about, I don't think it's been completely replicated, but there's no doubt if I went back to that hypothetical two people exposed to the same uh, stress, one develops PTSD, one not, it's not just <laughs> a simple factor. There are things that uh, are risk factors one way or the other. Genes clearly matter and they influence 
every disorder, certainly. I think what's, what's, what's interesting as far as I know with PTSD is that there's no monogenic gene, like there is a single gene that can cause Alzheimer's, there's a single gene that can cause Parkinson's. So it's always gonna be part of this gamish of many risks, whether the risks are many, many genes, somehow interacting with many environmental effects, but genes uh, matter. Uh, but in this case, the one thing to consider is that you can't do yet anything about your genes, but you can do something about your social structure. You can do th things about something about trying to accelerate forgetting by tapping into the me mechanisms of forgetting. So I think therapeutically, we might as well focus on things we can modify. Right. This is this actually fits in so well with your other work, your work on um, on Alzheimer's on or maybe just on normal memory loss in which, you know, you do a lot of work talking about nutrition and also about exercise and how that helps um, with the normal process of of memory loss, you know, normal cognitive aging. Um, I'm wondering, I know we'll probably have to turn it over to questions pretty soon, but um, one of the things you say pretty pretty early on in the book um, is we know now that forgetting is beneficial. How do we know that now? Well, it, it's a great question. It's a good way to some maybe wrap, wrap things up. And it relates to what you were asking about my work in pathological forgetting. So when I say the new science of forgetting, so everyone always thought, you know, forgetting is, is a failure of memory, not just everyone, but doctors and scientists. I, I, I was raised on that premise. The new science of forgetting has shown us that there's a completely separate group of mechanisms in our neuron that govern forgetting versus memory. In other words, it's not just memory failure. You have two separate control knobs, you know, a, a braking system and an accelerating system. That by itself, that's for normal forgetting. That by itself uh, suggests that it's not just the rusting of memory forgetting, normal forgetting. Now it implies that it might be beneficial, but that's a slightly dangerous inference to make on the idea that, well, if nature endowed us with something, there might there must be a purpose. Nature has endowed us with um, an appendix, and there are many examples of where that logic can be slippery. But then what I do is I go um, chapter by chapter re reviewing neurology, psychology, even philosophy to show how now that we know that there are separate mechanisms that work in balance, we can show what happens when that normal forgetting goes awry. And that's what allows me to conclude that it's beneficial. Now, I do wanna say something about the distinction between of pathological forgetting and normal forgetting, what you began with or what we began with. It turns out that the molecular mechanisms that are pathological, that underlie pathological memory, target the molecular components in our neurons that regulate memory. So pathological forgetting is tr truly is memory failure, but they don't touch the molecular mechanisms that regulate forgetting. Uh, and that is, I think, a nice way to distinguish. You were asking me in the beginning, how does one distinguish pathological forgetting from uh, uh, normal forgetting? One way is just uh, you know, your own experience, but even at the molecular level, if you peer inside neurons, you see separate toolboxes, one for, 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 for forgetting, one for memory. It's the memory toolbox that's targeted by both aging and Alzheimer's slightly differently. Great. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop grilling you um, and let uh, Kate uh, take over and let other people um, ask you questions, which I'm sure they'll want to do. Thank you for the questions, sir. They were great. You're welcome. All right, we have been receiving some great questions. Just a reminder to anyone in the who's watching tonight, um, if you would like to submit a question, go to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, let's see, I'm going to start with this question from Lawrence um, who asks, are we talking about absolute forgetting or are we talking about the ability to selectively attend to more general concepts? If I understand the spirit of the question, it's more the absolute. It's just a, it's just a trait we're born with. Um, it's not, you know, the issue of attention always informs memory and forgetting. We're inattentive. The way neuropsychologists view the brain, slightly simplistically, they, they organize the brain into different components. You have attention, you have memory, you have forgetting. So it's, I think, more of what the question, questioner was asking, more the absolute trait itself. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Abhishek. 
uh, who asks, why does forgetting evoke such deep emotions and a sense of loss compared to pathological forgetting? Hmm. That's, the, that's why these are great venues because I get questions I never considered. Well, first of all, uh, speaking for my patients, they, they consider pathological forgetting pretty, pretty devastating. So I'm not sure I completely agree with the premise of the question. Uh, I do think though that normal forgetting um, uh, under the old rubric of it being a memory failure in a world where we're so competitive in a world where we're information laden and we want to be the person who can quote stats and poetry i think we beat ourselves up too much about normal forgetting one of the things that i've experienced from writing the book is i've 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 stopped bristling at my moments of normal forgetting hopefully it's normal i'm right at the edge where it could be both but um i think that's a really important point we shouldn't i'm not saying you know celebrate your foibles forgetting normal forgetting could be frustrating obviously but um accept it as part of our makeup because with that we also um uh, enjoy many benefits so i would say if the questioner is really uh feeling a lot of um a lot of negativity over their own normal forgetting maybe by reading this book uh you can um relax on that a little bit So Lou asks a question similar to kind of what you were just talking about. So Lou says, now that I'm over 80, I'm having more trouble memorizing poems or speeches for theater. Should I give up feeling disappointment or are there techniques I might be able to use to do this a bit better? We have some other questions as well about kind of techniques people can try. Yeah, so I, 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 I hate to do this, but I have to really say something which I think is obvious. Obviously, if I'm being asked clinical questions, which this might be. The, the, I think it's self-evident that I can't really be giving advice, clinical advice. I will say, because I get this question from a question from a lot of friends and family uh, who call me and complain about a worsening of their forgetting, I do think it's worth seeing a doctor for, um, just because you really want to make sure that there might be something that might be treated. Uh, so I will make that recommendation. Uh, Let's assume it's normal forgetting, uh, normal age-related memory loss, sorry, not normal forgetting, pathological forgetting that's not caused by a disease, but like presbyopia, it's, no, it's normal age-related memory loss. Is there an intervention like wearing glasses that can improve my memory? The answer is that there must be. And I say that because we know so much about the brain. The brain is basically plastic and we know the mechanisms that govern it. There must be ways to harness that plasticity to enhance memory in later life if it's not Alzheimer's disease. What's surprising given that is how difficult it is to find that right prescription. But I could tell you what's it's gonna end up looking like something like cognitive exercise, video games, nutrition. That's something that I work on. So I do think there's gonna be a way to figure that out but what's remarkable is that I can't say anything more specific than physical exercise. That seems to meet the standards of uh, something that I can say routinely will help your memory in later life. Uh, Barry has a great question here. It's something that I think about too. Uh, Barry says, I have the sense that there is a difference between forgetting and the inability to access a memory. Perhaps an hour later, access becomes possible. Could you speak to that? Yes, and that gets to the metaphors that Sue was talking about. So I, I will very, very briefly tell you that you have the best analogy that you're staring at right now for how memory, the brain organizes memory, uh, and that's your computer. Because if you think about it, you type something on your screen, you need to click save that, that means you're shifting that information to your hard drive. You come back tomorrow, you have many, many documents you wanna click open, okay? That's the simple triad of a memory system, a storage and an ability to move information into that storage side and ability to open information from a lot of memory stored. What you're describing is really a retrieval problem. And that's actually quite common. I'm not sure if the questioner was asking on, have they ex experienced worsening of that, uh, Kate, or is that just, yeah. That's the kind of um, the blanks we shoot sometimes when we're trying to think of the right word, when we're trying to access that one thing that will win the debate and we can't, we can't uh, access it. And then there's that um, experience of, you know, 10 minutes later, 
That's the word I wanted. That's the piece of information. That is a retrieval problem because it's not a storage problem because the memory is there, right? It's not a um, click save problem because you've done that. And that's often the case with words. So it's a retrieval problem. I'm not saying it's a good problem to have, but if it's part of normal aging, it's just the way the brain has decided to enhance our ability to navigate a complicated world that's blooming and buzzing with information, information that often stings. Um, that's basically what you're experiencing and why. I'm not sure that's satisfactory, however. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. Um, let's see, Andrew has a question. I'm kind of jumping around a bit here. So Andrew says, thank you for the talk. I just finished Still Alice, and I know that you said you don't want to poeticize pathological forgetting. Um, but in the nature of optimism, are there silver linings you talked about today in regards to normal forgetting that are also applicable in some way to pathological forgetting? Well, thank you for that question, because my patients have taught me a lot, and this is a good opportunity to acknowledge them, and I dedicate the book to them. I'm not sure if this is the silver lining for them, but what they've taught me and people who've tracked patients with Alzheimer's is that we over-index information and memory. We just love memory. It's sort of like a, like, a, like a sport, right? Who can remember more? Who can quote more? And what my patients, particularly in the early stages, not the later stages, but and the early stage of Alzheimer's can last for 10, 15 years now, we know. In that stage, when they're having a difficult time retrieving information, storing new information, a little bit unfocused, they still have taught me they can live a full emotional life. They love their family. They love art. They laugh uh, and, and they love art. And so the lesson that I've learned from my patients, and I thank them for that lesson, is that I certainly live in a world where we over-index information. I had to memorize cranial nerves and differential diagnoses. They've taught me that it's not all about memory, life. Uh, here's an interesting question from Kathy. So Kathy asks, if storage is enhanced by emotion and we dial storage back by lowering emotions, is there something about aiding helpful forgetting that might be enhanced by mindfulness and lessening reactions? I'd like to make sure I understand the question. So might mindfulness help with accelerating emotional memories? I think so. And I think, uh, you know, uh, Sue sort of talked about one form of psychotherapy to accelerate uh, emotional forgetting, uh, and that's exposure therapy. But psycho, more, more detailed cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT and, and, and talk therapy, in many ways, what that tries to do, this is, I'm sure the psychologists uh, on the call will object to this simplification, but basically what you're trying to do is to disentangle uh, a memory from its associations. And if you're mindful of why something triggers a negative feeling, I can very uh, easily imagine how that will accelerate uh, the forgetting process by dissociating those connections we talked about earlier. Sorry, I'm pouring through several questions here. All right, um, an anonymous attendee says, I've always felt like a good night's sleep has helped with my memory and I wish I could get it more consistently. In addition to physical exercise, is there any evidence to support this? Well, that's so interesting because I do talk a lot about sleep in the chapter on creativity. And it turns out that sleep does two things that improves your mind uh, and so if we talked about connections, so here the metaphor would be, imagine that there are millions of connections across your cortex and that's true. And that's how memories are stored. They're not stored across two neurons. And so now imagine a field of grass of connections, right? Basically that's what happens when you live your day. There's so much information that our brain is being exposed to, most of it not important. And yet our brain is sticky with storing that information. What sleep does, first and foremost, it allows us to smart forget. Sleep, we now know, induces forgetting for the information that's unnecessary for the chaff, so to speak. But at the same time, and this is where the grass metaphor works, if it's just mowing down all these connections of information we don't need, 
it topiary like accentuates the memories we do need. So in certain sense, it does help certain aspects of memory, but fundamentally, if anyone has been forced to be awake for two or three days and they feel like their mind is staticky and they can't concentrate, that's because they have too much extraneous information. It's a great way to experience the detriments of not having forgetting. It's a mind that has not benefited from uh, the forgetting uh, mechanisms that occur during sleep. That's really interesting. Um, okay, so this question reminds me, you, you talked about Borges earlier, but this question reminds me a lot of Proust. Uh, so the question from Han is, is there a special role of music in helping memory retrieval? So we think of the sonata, I think it's the sonata in Proust or the Madeline cookie if we're thinking of other senses. So is there a way to help with memory or maybe to help with forgetting? Because now that I'm... <laughs> Just, oh, sorry. Is there a role of music in helping memory retrieval? Well, yes, absolutely. There, there absolutely is. And, and maybe I should have been coached not to uh, offer too many opinions, but I will tell you, I love Proust, but Nabokov got it more accurately about memory. Proust sort of describes memory as a sort of opening up of a, of a pop-up book and it's all there. Nabokov was the one that showed that memory is not um, a museum of natural history, but a museum of modern art. <laughs> and I think uh, if we're going to go for literary references, I, I would I would read Speak Memory. But on the point of music, music, it's so interesting. So yes, music, odors, any stimulant, again, back to the fundamental unit of memory is associations. Anything that will trigger that association will be effective um, and evocative and Odors are like that, songs are like that, because they are sort of onto themselves often, particularly if they're during our earlier years. One super interesting observation, if I can extend on that in patients with Alzheimer's, often patients who are musicians, they lose a lot of information. We talked about how their hard drives ultimately get affected, but often their musical abilities are maintained and it's quite remarkable to see, and it gives them a lot of joy. Okay, we have um, we have a comment from an anonymous attendee that I wonder if you can touch on um, about the distinction between forgetting and ignoring. I don't know if you've had that question before. I, I haven't, but I think I understand the essence of it. I think, it, you know, sometimes when I hear people complain about forgetting and I start the book slightly arch by saying I'm a little tired of people complaining about forgetting because it's great for you to celebrate your forgetting. I don't mind anyone asking me questions and I quickly qualify by saying it's the privilege of doctoring to offer advice. But often what I hear about people who describe their memory, they say, well, I'm really good on things I pay attention to and I'm not really great on things I ignore. And that might be true. There's certainly truth to that. Obviously, if you're focused on, if you're a chess player and focused on one thing, you'll remember certain things better. But often I think that's a post hoc narrative. I think people actually just have forgetting for certain things. And um, it's not so much whether they're neglectful or not, but I'm not sure if that's really what the anonymous uh, questioner was asking. <laughs> We have a great, this isn't a question, it's a comment from William, but I'm just gonna read it because I liked it. Uh, not a question, but a memory experience. While trying to remember the name of a high school teacher, my mind pictured a clown. When I finally remembered the name, I realized that it was Ronald Donald. I was associating that name with the well-known McDonald's clown and my brain was just showing me the way. I liked that. That, that. That's actually spot on. And I don't know if anyone has heard about these memory magicians, right? These, 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 almost um, these, these memory athletes who can walk into a room and memorize 200 names in a setting. It, it, it's quite remarkable. And what they use is exactly that. They actually tap into what the hippocampus does in creating a scenario. And the more you populate that stage with information and associations, the more you can actually retrieve the memory. So that's a very interesting anecdote. And I think it fits with what I understand the way memory works. Yeah. Um, we have another question about sleep from Anna who says, regarding sleep helping aspects of memory, 
is there a difference between natural sleep and sleep with AIDS, such uh -huh. as medication? Yes. Yes, that's a great, great question. And there's a lot, there's a, there's a real debate about that because there is apparently a distinct a difference. Now, I'm not a sleep doctor, but I know enough about this to know that some, uh, now when Anna's talking about sleep aids, I, I think she's talking about pharmaceuticals or other ways of engaging with sleep, sleep hygiene and stuff. But the medications we take, the soporifics as we call them, are fraught, they're problematic. The one thing I'll say, and now I'm sort of offering an opinion that's outside of my area of expertise, I find that we tend to obsess over the eight hour sleep slot. It's almost the industrialization of sleep. We need to go to sleep at 11 and wake up at seven. And if I have less than that, I'm not gonna function. What we really need, and we do need actually six or eight hours of sleep a day, but it doesn't have to be within a 24 hour period um, within one block. And so if you take a quick nap or if you go to sleep early, wake up in the middle of the night and then sleep in a little bit, as long as it's six to eight hours, that seems to work. And the reason I say that, because I meet many, many people who are so obsessed at this block idea that they end up over medicating themselves. And these soporifics, as I think most people know from the, just the general uh, 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 press can get people into trouble. It's not identical, it's not the same thing. Were you just saying, or were you saying just now that it's like not the, I guess I keep reading things about how taking a nap for longer than a certain amount of time is a bad thing. Well, I'm not going to argue on that because I'm not a sleep yeah. doctor. I, <laughs> okay, I, 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 I don't think it is. I think, you know, your boss might think it is if you have a boss. <laughs> um, but I do think, I do think that it, that what is, what sleep physicians have told me and, and physiologists the eight, the six to eight hours is right. And by the way, we all do it down to flies. It's not just us, all animals do it down to flies. It's crazy. Yeah. And yet it doesn't have to be in one block that I know for sure. Um, and so there, there's this great um, descriptions of Catherine the, the Great, uh, I forget who wrote the biography, which I read a few years ago, where she would go to sleep, <laughs> you know, of course she's Catherine the Great, she can do whatever she wants, but she would go to sleep at eight, you know, wake up at one, in the morning, do whatever she wanted to do for a few hours and then go back to sleep. And I have to say, I when I wake up in the middle of the night and have an important day, I try not to fight it and go right to my ambient. I try to say, well, maybe I'll just read a chapter um, for a half hour and I'll go back to sleep. That seems to help me. And now I'm getting a little too personal again, so, so there you go. Um... Okay, I've seen this question a couple of times. Um, so not to be clinical, but are there techniques for forgetting things that you want to forget? That's such a great question. That's been asked of me since I published the book. So remember to sleep. Uh, I'm sure, you know, we talked about exposure therapy and formal ways of doing it. It, it does seem like a, like a tautology or a Mobius slip, a, a strip, if I'm gonna say, remind yourself to forget that seems like it's not going to work. Um, so uh, I, I have spoken to a clinician who has mentioned that they are thinking of that. One thing I can say, which I find interesting is because I am developing drugs for pathological forgetting that marriage counselors have told me that if I ever develop a drug that will accelerate forgetting, please contact them because their practice will <laughs> will surge. And I think that's actually funny, but sort of interesting on the point of trying to let things go if you can. Uh, I, as far as I know, there are no drugs out there. Actually, there are the drugs we talked about. Oxytocin does that, uh, but only temporarily. Um, ecstasy does that temporarily. Uh, I think um, there's a real interesting research now into both oxy, uh, um, uh, M MDMA, ecstasy and, and LSD for PTSD. And that's a story to track. That's going to really go the distance. I think most people feel that. And to a certain extent, that's a pharmacological way to um, ultimately eradicate fearful memories. Uh, but nothing, one thing I could say, and I do say it in the book, and maybe Sue, I was thinking of you when I wrote it, um, eye to eye contact. We talked about socialization, right? And so how, how the PTSD doctor taught me that socialization is a way to induce fear of forgetting. If you want to experience that, if you're lucky enough to have an animal at home, look in your dog's eye, eyes. Now, of course, this is a little bit wifty, but if you do that really close, I feel this sort of, 
um, relaxation of anxiety. I truly believe that that's part of the oxytocin uh, uh, inducing of fear of forgetting. And I know that because there's really good science that have shown that eye to eye gazing with our dogs causes both them and us to release oxytocin into our brains. Try it at home. You can try it right now with my dog right next to me. Okay. <laughs> um, Abhishek, again, has another really interesting question in here. Um, Autistic patients show behavioral inflexibility and repetitive behavior. How might forgetting play a role there? Yeah, so that, that, that actually works with the formulation. And again, this is just a loose interpretation of Kanner's view and some other views. There are many views about autism. We cannot reduce this, but it works because um, if, if, if you really have no forgetting, so what, 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 what the research has shown from the basic science, if I ask you to learn a maze, a way out of a maze, you'll need your memory to do that. If I now change the maze a little bit, you might think, well, all I need is to have more memories and I'll learn that. It turns out you learn that a lot more efficiently if you engage your forgetting mechanisms. So if you think of um, house remodeling, you need to both be able to demolish and build or, 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 or chiseling and sculpting with marble. You need both. And that's turned out to be actually true, that you need your forgetting to be flexible in the face of a very rapidly changing world. And so one interpretation uh, a la Connor is that if your forgetting is not quite up to snuff as it might be with some people with forgetting, that's why they're inflexible. They just don't want to experience the anxiety of change because they can't um, modulate the memories in their minds. That makes a lot of sense, especially with like remodeling a house like you just mentioned. The idea of design projects, if you can't unimagine what it looks like currently, I don't know if that's related, but. I, I mean, one thing, if I may, Kate, just quickly, if there are anyone out there, any parents or people with autism who object to that chapter, please write me. So far, I, I was trying to be very sensitive to this. And so far, what I've heard from parents and, and people who have autism, that they actually found it illuminating. And I really hope that I didn't hurt anyone's feelings. Yeah. Um, Sue, we are almost out of time, but I don't know if you had any final questions you wanted to ask or final comments before we wrap things up. Um, well, final comment, uh, Scott. Um, I think that everyone who is listening to you is definitely going to want to read the book, um, which is to their benefit. Uh, I think it's great. I did have one question um, when you were talking about the, uh, the drugs for sleep and you mentioned Ambien, um, but I wonder what about like THC or CBD or, you know, those kinds of chemicals, which I don't know that they actually interfere or engage with sleep itself, but I think that they probably relax people and maybe even allow them um, the ability to kind of forget what's going on and just yeah, seek into sleep. Spot on. So you're absolutely right. So, you know, in, in the, in the, in the um, categories of drugs, you have soporifics, ones that are designed for sleep per se, the ambience, the, but then you have the anxiolytics, the ones that remove anxiety, CBD and others. A anxiolytics are actually lysing, they're cutting away fear memories, at least temporarily. So I completely think that that's the right way to go. Um, Kate, before we run out of time, could I say, could I say something um, in thanking Sue? So um, if you do read the book, go, and if you do make it to the end, uh, if you get to the acknowledgments, you'll see that Sue is someone I deeply, deeply thank. And that was genuine. Uh, this was a new experience for me. I'm meant to be a good science writer. I, without hubris, I swear, it, I didn't realize that writing a general science book is like learning to use a new musical instrument. And Sue was with me throughout the whole two or three years I was writing it, including one dark, dark winter night when I thought I couldn't pull it off. So I'd like to thank Sue. And uh, for those who haven't read Sue, she, she, she's one of my favorite writers, um, particularly about science, but anything. So she's been a real, real great mentor for me. So thank you, Sue, in public. Thank you, Scott, for that. And really, thanks for the book. I mean, I really think that people are gonna learn so much and maybe get a little less fearful of you know, kind of natural processes as 
not only as we age, but just as we go through our lives. So I, I, I think it's a real public service, but it's also just for anyone who hasn't read it, it's, it's a really good book to read. It's really, I don't know if fun is the right word, but it's so easy to read and you'll learn so, so much. Um, I, I did, and I spent a fair amount of time talking to you in, you know, over the years, and I, I learned a ton, so I, I'm sure everyone will. Thank you. Thanks both one more time. Um, and the final thank you, thank you everyone at home for joining us this evening. Uh, if you would like to learn more, I've put links in the chat, but copies of Forgetting are for sale on harvard.com. And you can learn more about the Harvard Science Book Talk series. So on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science and the Harvard Library, have a great evening, everyone. Please keep reading and learning and please be well. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks, Kate. Kate.